Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Late Night Talk with me, your host, Ahmad Ali, and another episode where we commemorate the martyrdom of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam by shedding uh, lights on some of the aspects uh, revolving around the character of Prophet Muhammad. Yesterday, uh, we talked about how the Prophet, and then we cleared up some of the misconceptions about how the Prophet uh, propagated and spread Islam. Uh, and one of the misconceptions was about spreading Islam by the sword and that was discussed with my honorable guest Sheikh Usama Al-Attar Assalamu alaikum Sheikh Wa alaikum salam How are you? Alhamdulillah very good to see you once again uh, in Karbala May Allah always unite us in these holy places Insha'Allah Insha'Allah uh, Now uh, Sheikh when it comes to intercession uh, today's topic as well there's a lot of misconceptions revolving around this topic intercession uh, we find that Ahl al-Bayt alayhi wasalam emphasize on this idea uh, also, we see other schools of thought within uh, within uh, Sunni traditions uh, also emphasizing on this. However, there's one that the minorities uh, that say that if you believe in this, you're a, a non-believer, a non-Muslim. However, uh, many Quranic verses also play emphasis on intercession. To begin it off, what is intercession, and why is it important? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. The word شفاعة شفاعة comes from the root word شفاعة. شفاعة means to add something to another. To add? Add. That's why, for example, there is a صلاة in the middle of the night, part of صلاة الليل, the night prayer, the midnight prayer. And it is called Salatul Shafa'a. It's a two rak'at salat. Shaf, yes. And then there's Salatul Watr. Watr yeah. means one. Shaf means two. You've added one rak'at to another rak'at. And hence Salatul Shafa'a. So Shaf, Shafa'a literally means adding something to something else. Mm. So why it not call Salat Subuh? Sorry. Why not call Salat Subuh Shaf as well? As Salatul Subuh. It was given Salatul Fajr because it's ah, a specific fajr, time fajr. of Fajr. Okay. Therefore, it's not to confuse it with other Salat. It was given. However, it is also two Raka'at. Raka'atun Tashfa'u. Raka'atun Ukhra. You know, one, one Raka'at with another Raka'at. So, and then it was also used to add something weaker to something stronger. For example, mm -hmm. if a person wants heat, and he's cold, he ignites fire. The fire provides, adds the human being heat with heat because the human being has the weakness of need of heat. He cannot provide internal heat. He needs to get that heat externally. What provides him with heat in this case? It's fire. the fire. So the fire Thus, shafa'a, tashfa' for heat. Okay, so that's the literal meaning of the word. Literally, it's adding something to something else. Also, used as adding something weaker to something stronger. So that, uh, or something stronger, stronger to something, something weaker, weaker. I yeah. apologize. So that it provides it with some of this strength. Yeah. Whether it is, for example, the strength could be physical strength, could be heat, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. So that's the literal meaning of the word. Yes. Now, we then look at it from the Quranic perspective and that is providing the help of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and his divine family, the Imams alayhi salam, providing help and assistance to the rest of the creation on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, the people are weak, they are being judged, they are in need of the strength yes. of the Prophet and his faith and his holy uh, family, peace be upon them all. So they provide the strength to lift up the people into Jannah, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. Okay. So that is the essence of it. Now, if we take a look at Shafa'a from the Quranic perspective, mm -hmm. the verses may fall under three categories. Mm -hmm. One category suggests there is no shafa'a. Yes. Second category suggests that there is shafa'a, but only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. 
third category he suggests chooses. there is shafa'a and some individuals or humans or creation of Allah have the ability to perform this shafa'a. Isn't that contradictory though? Isn't that beautiful? Exactly. So now we need to really understand the essence of these three contexts. Yeah. And that's something important we'd like to highlight. We cannot take one verse of the Quran and isolate it, treat it as an in isolation. Quran is to be taken as a whole. Yes. So we take one verse, we have to look at another verse and another verse and combine it all together to come up with a conclusion. Yes. People who reject shafa'a in Islam, they say mm -hmm. there is no shafa'a. They've taken a look at only the first group of verses. Yes. People who say there is shafa'a, but only Allah has the one. They've only looked at the second group of verses. Mm -hmm. People who say there is shafa'a and there are people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them to uh, the ability to do shafa'a, they've looked at the three verses. But they don't do shafa'a to everybody, to a select group of people. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take a look at these three c uh, categories of verses very briefly, very quickly. Yes. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 48, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا لَا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَلَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْهَا شَفَاعًا mm -hmm. And fear a day when no soul, no self would suffice for another self at all, nor will intercession be accepted from it. No intercession. There's no intercession there. Allah says, it's done. In another ayah, Allah says in Surah Al-Muddathir, فَمَا تَنْفَعُهُمْ شَفَاعَةُ الشَّافِعِينَ wow. That the intercession of those who want to intercede will not help them at all. You know, So there is a group of people whom the shafa'a will not help. However, those people who do not have a group of you know, shafa'a interceding help them, let's take a look who they are. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Surah al muttathir a group of people who will be in paradise will be asking a group of people who are being punished in the hellfire and ask them, what ended you up in the hellfire? Why did you guys end up in the hellfire? So there's a communication apparently among the people of Jannah and the people of Jahannam. Yeah. But it's a one-way communication. It can be established by the people of Jannah, yeah. not the people of Jahannam. They cannot communicate or start the communication with the people of Jannah. So it's a one-way, but they can reply back. And with the people of Jannah, interestingly. So that kind of gives us a very interesting way about Jannah and the hellfire on the Day of Judgment. We believe in them as separate places. They're far away from one another, but apparently somehow... There's there is, a connection. Maybe through, you know, technology of the iPad or some, you know, wireless technology that Allah cool. subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has developed. Allah or Bluetooth. Allah knows. Cool. Anyways, they said, what ended you up in Jahannam? They replied, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We did not, we never prayed. We did not used to pray. We did not feed the hungry. We did not care about people. We used to belie the day of judgment. We never prayed. We never fasted. We never did any good deed in our life. And we belied the day of judgment. In other words, we believe that there's, no, there's nothing in there. Those people will not achieve any shafa'a, nor will any shafa'a help them. So there is a group of people, those who deny the existence, the creation of Allah, they deny everything, the existence of Allah, while recognizing, understanding there is a creator, but they just wanted to deny, and they were in denial, denial, denial. Such people, unfortunately, will not achieve any shafa'a because of their own <coughs> denial. Okay, So that's one group. That's one group. The second, the second group of ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the, to the believers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all the shafa'a. قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ جَمِيعًا That okay. in Surah Al-Zumar, Allah has all the shafa'a. Okay. Now, some people say, see, no one else does shafa'a. Only Allah. Well, except for Allah, okay. We say, okay. Absolutely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ultimate shafa'a, the whole power of shafa'a. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can delegate that power to certain individuals of his creation. Yes. This is not shirk association because we say Allah delegates, Allah provides the ability to do shafa'a. People of his creation do not intrinsically have that ability. Allah instills it. Allah puts it. Allah gives it to them. That's a difference. 
when you say someone independently of Allah billah, God forbid has the power of shafa'ah that is shirk mm -hmm. when you say someone has been given the power of shafa'ah by Allah that's different that's not, that's not shirk yeah Allah gives a visit, Allah gives whatever, so yeah. there's no shirk here. Mm -hmm. So this is the big difference between the two uh, things. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, in Ayat al kursi many people have it memorized. Yes. Man the ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa Who will do the shafa'a but with the permission of, of Allah. Allah. So there are... People and then and then interestingly Allah says in the ayah of Surah Mudathir, "Fama tanfa'uhum shafa'atu." Shafi'in. So there are shafi'in. There are, there are people who, who do intercession, okay. but those people will not benefit from their intercession. And Allah says Subhanahu wa Taala also, "Wala uh, yashfa'una illa limanir tawa," that they will not do shafa'a except for whom Allah is pleased or accepts the shafa'a to be performed for them. Yes. So basically, if we put all these verses together, we say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ultimate power of shafa'ah. Absolutely. He's got the ultimate supreme power, independent power of shafa'ah. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives that power. In fact, not only in the, even in, the, in dunya, but we'll come to that later. Yeah. Allah gives that ability out of his mercy, out of his power to a certain selected group of his creation. Yes. This group, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they have the ability to perform shafa'a, intercede yes. on some people's behalf. Yes. This group of people, they will intercede on the behalf of those who believe in Allah, but have committed some sins, mm. have committed some crimes. Yeah. Those, however, who never believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they chose to reject the message of Allah willingly knowingly, deliberately, such people will not achieve or deserve the shafa'a of the Prophet and his family. Mm -hmm. So that's what we find in these verses. Perfect. Now, who are those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them the ability of intercession? Uh, because uh, we find in narrations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophets and gave the Imams only uh, the ability of intercession. Yet we find other narrations of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq saying that the ones who visit Karbala, they also get the ability uh, of intercession. Uh, now, is that given by Allah to those people? Or is uh, are, are these narrations contradicting the, the, the actual ayahs? Because someone who has the ability of intercession has to be sinless, has to know what that person is actually going through. Yes. Uh, and inshallah we'll get to touch upon uh, also knowing and the knowledge of the unseen but that's probably later on in the episode but uh, how is this possible Allah has full mm -hmm. uh, ability of intercession he gives it certain individuals mm -hmm. now those individuals give it to other individuals do they have that ability they have that ability yes absolutely with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the permission. Just but like how Allah would a, a sinful person have the ability of, of intercession? Well, well, at the time when they start performing the shafa'a, they would not be sinful anymore. They would have had their shafa'a by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to purify them, to cleanse themselves. And now that they've achieved the state where they've been cleansed of all their sins, and now they're ready to go to Jannah, some of those individuals will then ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them the permission to intercede on behalf of let's say a sibling, uh, a, a parent, a spouse, a child, a spouse, etc. or a, a friend. Yeah. So they will choose some people whom they will try to select and because they've now been purified, now they're all sinless, they're pure, they're ready to go to Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will give them the, the ability to do such intercession mm -hmm. now a lot of misconceptions are revolving around this uh, because many have the claim uh, that if God gives the Prophet the ability of intercession and then they have narration saying that whoever is in love with Ahlul Bayt and follows Ahlul Bayt uh, automatically he'll be uh, Shafa'a will reach him uh, then what's the problem you know with having a couple of sins in this world because we know that the Prophet is going to do a shafa'a for us. 
but we'll get to answer that about after the short break if you want inshallah, inshallah. Uh, shaykhana so respective viewers do stay tuned for we'll be back very shortly and we'll continue the topic about the misconceptions revolving around shafa'a that's after the break so do stay tuned Respective viewers, welcome back. Hope inshallah enjoyed uh, that short report. But before the break, uh, we were having a discussion with our very special guest, Sheikh Osama Al Attar, and we have been discussing uh, and clearing up some of the misconceptions revolving around intercession shafa'a. Welcome back, Habib Sheikh. Thank you very Allah much. Now, before the break, we asked a question, uh, and this is, is going around the world uh, this idea uh, that someone is loving Ahlul Bayt, you know, he, he does all the rituals he does everything uh, sometimes misses some stuff uh, but a lot of people say <coughs> that you don't need to pray you don't need to do anything because if you love Ali Talib if you love the Ahlul Bayt you're gonna go straight into Jannah the intercession will reach them ultimately you know it's no Shia can go to hell all of them have to go to heaven now is that true or you know, we read the ayah of the Quran clearly, just as I mentioned before the break. Mm -hmm. I said, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمُسْكِينَ you know, Those who end up in the hellfire, وَالْعِيَابُ بِاللَّهِ They said, we did not pray, we did not feed the hungry. We used to kind of engage in vain talk. Uh, we used to deny the day of judgment. And hence, they end up in Jahannam. And, 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 and Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'un, and woe upon those who pray but take their salat lightly. You know, they don't respect the salat. So it's clear from the ayat that one has to perform the awajibat, the obligations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. Has to pray, has to fast, has to perform all these deeds. Refraining from the sins because there are conse consequences to sins. Now, some people, if they have performed their a'mal, their deeds, everything, but their deeds is not 100%. I mean, look at our Salat. How much in our Salat do we actually concentrate? 10%, 20%, 50%? As soon as we say Allah Akbar, we go I mean, somewhere else. I mean, that's, that's our Salat. Look at our Siyam. The way we, so although we're doing acts of obedience, they're not acts of disobedience, but they're not good. They're not in their perfect state. We need the Prophet's Shafa'a to make them 100%. To boost, boost it up, them a, up little a little bit. bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So now what, when we commit a sin though, there will be a consequences, a consequence. Some consequences will be in dunya. You might uh, see the, 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 the effect, the consequence of your sins. Allahumma ghfir li al-dhunub alati tunzilu al-bala, dhunub tughayyiru al-ni'am, dhunub tunzilu al-niqam, and so on as we read in Dua Kumail. Oh Allah, forgive these sins that might send calamities upon me, uh, that would prevent my dua from being accepted, etc. So there are some consequences here in dunya. There are some consequences in the qabr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might make a person endure some punishment in the grave yeah okay and if a person then gets purified in the grave as a consequence of his of his of his uh, sins then on the day of judgment he'll be pure and allah will grant him the shafa'a of the prophet sallallahu and he can go to jannah mm -hmm. if however there's still some leftover of his disobedience he may end up in jahannam for uh, for some time now, he might stay there forever or yeah. by the permission of Allah, stay there temporarily and then be transferred over to Jannah after Allah's forgiveness uh, bestows upon him. Mm -hmm. So there is that, con that concept where you can do whatever you want and then Allah will forgive us or the Prophet will just have uh, intercession for us is a fallacy that some people try to propagate and promote just so that they can justify some of their, their, uh, their ways of life. Yes. Now, uh, Sheikh, a, a very brief answer so I can get to the second question. Um, does Allah or, or is Allah selective when it comes to prophets and their intercession or do all the prophets have the ability of intercession? Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says the prophet, our prophet, sallallahu there is no one, according to the hadith, ma min ahadin, no one on the day of judgment but will be in need of the shafa'a of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Everyone on the day of judgment will be in need of the intercession of Rasulullah. Perfect. Everyone. Everyone. It means who? Even the prophets. Even the prophets will need that. Shabbat. How about the Imams? The, no, the Imam Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Okay, wa Ali Muhammad. The same because they're no one wahid. Okay, one no. beautiful. Now the prophets, the thing is, do the prophets have the ability of intercession or do they not? 
other than Prophet Muhammad. They may have their ability to intercede on behalf of their nations, their communities, okay. their people who, who believe in them. Perfect. Now in chapter uh, 11 verse 46, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, when Nuh tried to intercede on behalf of his son, Allah told him, stop, he's not from your family anymore. Correct. So but but what, what, was, what did we say? Who are the people who don't qualify for shafa'ah? The people who didn't pray, but this is the Prophet's son. Oh, it doesn't matter. He, he, he belied the day of judgment. He belied the command of Allah. He belied his father. So even if he's your son, too bad. So, but the prophet, the prophet tried to intercede. In dunya, not in akhirah, but he was told in dunya that he's he not does not qualify for your intercession. Uh -huh. So let go of him. And he would never, ever do that. Uh, he would never intercede for him on the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we, we see that also... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even during the battles of Prophet Muhammad, uh, as soon as someone would uh, convert to Islam, uh, right away, his, uh, even if, if it's in war and you're about to strike him and he becomes Muslim, you cannot strike him anymore. He, he's on the safe side now. Yes. Uh, but, so technically that's intercession. Uh, the, his conversion to Islam was a sort of intercession him from, uh, from death, if you will. That's different. No. Uh, we might call it as intercession. Islam mm -hmm. interceded for him. Yeah. However, Al Islam yajubu amma qabli. Islam forgives everything beforehand. So if mm -hmm. a person becomes a Muslim, let's say at the age of fifty, for example, at the age of fifty he finds the truth and yeah. he becomes a follower of this beautiful religion. Then he says, Well, for the past fifty years I've never prayed. I, I may even have drank alcohol, I may have committed some sins. We say that's fine because you were not a follower of Islam. Now that you have accepted the, and embraced the religion of Islam, all your past deeds have been forgiven. Mm -hmm. So now you need to move on forward. Perfect. Now we see Pharaoh also when, when he's about to die, he says, now I believe in the God of Moses. Mm -hmm. So why did intercession not reach him? Because it was in his, when he saw death. When you see death, then too late. The time is over. So the people during the, so you're telling me no one during the time of the Prophet converted out of fear? They did. They did. They did not see the death, literally the angel of death coming to them, taking their soul away. Fir'aun saw the angel of death coming to take his soul away. At that moment, he said, I believe now. But that was the moment when he saw the angel of death too late now. Because now he's coming to take your soul away. At that point, it's too late. Any time before that point, before you see the angel of death, even if it's five minutes, I'm in the war. Like you know, you like you say the example. People in the battle, they see the Muslims getting victorious. True, but they don't still see the angel of death. So maybe to protect their lives, they said the shahada. Khalas, Islam says you cannot. You have to take it by the literal word. Yeah. Because you don't see what's in the heart of yeah. the people. So you cannot make assumption. Yes. Anyone who says the Shahada is a Muslim, and this is something that is agreed upon by all Muslims. Yes. And that's why it's very, very important to realize, and this is just as a side note, very important to realize that whatever those so-called Muslims, in fact, these terrorist groups are doing under the name of Islam by killing Muslims, contradicts everything about religion. And therefore, these people do not even belong to the religion of Islam. Wow. Because Islam clearly states Anyone who even utters La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He's a Muslim And khalas You cannot touch him Or hurt him Or harass him And what those people are doing Is completely against the religion And mm -hmm. the uh, Now uh, Shaykhna What also uh, Is equally important As uh, intercession Or in terms of Misconceptions if you will um, Is the aspect of Ilm uh, al We have approximately five minutes till the end of the show. I know we don't have a lot, a lot of time to talk about this, but it is, it, it's, it's also controversial as well in the terms that Allah says, I am the one that has knowledge of uh, the unseen, and then He says, I choose who to give it to, and then there, no one knows the knowledge of the unseen. So it's, it's, it's similar to intercession. Now, what's the issue with the knowledge of the unseen? Again, it's the same thing. It's very, it's, it's very same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the knowledge of the unseen independently. Allah does not need anyone to gain the knowledge of the unseen from. He is independently on his uh, essence, in his essence, is capable of knowing everything. Mm -hmm. However, 
he chooses to bestow some of this knowledge to selected group of his creation. Isa alayhi salam, according to the Quran, tells the people, I can tell you of what you keep in food in your houses, of food in your houses. I can tell you. I can tell you what will happen later on. How does he know that? Allah gave him the ability to know. He can tell people what to do and what not to do. Uh, and so on and so forth. So the Prophet ﷺ were given this power by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know yes. the knowledge of the unseen. Of the unseen. Now, uh, Shaykh, does knowledge vary of the unseen? Yes, it does. Uh, from, diff from people, from prison, how? Yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the degrees of the knowledge of the unseen. Mm -hmm. He has the ultimate knowledge. Good. And then one degree less than his ultimate knowledge is the knowledge of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the prophets then vary in that range. Mm -hmm. Ibrahim had a high ranking of the knowledge. Other prophets were to follow. Yes. Uh, now, perfectly mentioned that after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad and Muhammad wa sallam, Muhammad, and Muhammad uh, comes the Ahlul Bayt uh, who have knowledge of, of, of the unseen. Uh, now, Sheikhna, what is knowledge of the unseen? It's knowledge of things that will happen in the future. In the future. And no, not just in the future. Anything that has happened where the Prophet physically was not there, was not present. He knows. How oh, perfect. So, in a situation, the Imam is able to know what this person is about to do. Yep. Perfect. Now, how did the Imams go into their death? Was it not suicide in this terms? No, it's not suicide at all for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, when it is a matter of saving the religion, all Muslims say it is permissible to give up your life, sacrifice your life for the sake of saving religion. Just like, for example, we read, we read in the battle of Tabuk, Ghazwat Tabuk, and what happened, uh, sorry, Mu'ta, my apologies, Mu'ta, Mu Mu the battle of Mu'ta, Ja'far al Tayyar and Abdullah ibn Rawah, ta'ala alayhim, the leaders of the camp of the Muslims, when they saw that the enemies are getting victorious, getting victory, they said, let's go for the shahada that Allah, that Allah has promised uh, the reward of those who get martyred in the way of Allah. So they went and they got killed. Salamullahi alayhim. The Prophet did not say they committed suicide. You know, they could have just ran away. Perfect. Defending the religion of Islam, defending religion, sacrificing your life for the sake of religion is accepted by all Muslims. Our Imams sacrificed their lives to keep the religion of Islam alive. Perfect. That's one. Second, when Allah orders you to do something, then you do it regardless of what it is. This is what's called taslim and riva, that submission and being pleased with what whatever he dictates. Allah orders the imam to eat that poisoned food at that point. But There's an order and there is a matter of submission now. Shaykhna, when, when someone, and for example, when you mentioned Ja'far al Tayyar and the battle of Mu'ta and him dying um, perfectly, he was defending Islam. Imam al Hussein, knowing he was going to die, but he was defending Islam. Right. He did it defending Islam. But when we see the Imams drinking poison, when Ma'mun gave the poison to Imam al Rada, Imam al Rada drank it like he, he, he knows that that's poison. Yes. According to knowledge of the unseen in the Quran, yes, he, he knows. Yes. Shaykhna, isn't that committing suicide? So, uh, yeah, and for example, you know I, I'm putting poison in a glass in front of you hmm? and I give it to you. Yes. You're going to drink it. Well, if Allah orders me to drink it, then I will drink it. If the command comes from Allah, only from Allah, Why would or Allah from a divine person like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa you know, or the Imam al-Ma'asum. Why would Allah tell someone to drink poison? To test their submission. Test their submission. How much can they submit? That's why they were in the pinnacle of the submission to Allah. Allah orders them, they do. Didn't Allah order Ibrahim to slain his son? Yeah. Why did Ibrahim do it? Isn't this out of the norm, out of the ordinary? Isn't this something that people say uh, he is killing his own son? Yeah. Well, because Allah orders and Ibrahim submits. Even if it's killing yourself or killing your son. When Allah orders, you say, yes, master, I will do so. Allah orders Ahlul Bayt السلام, at that point to drink this poison so they submit to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with pleasure, with happiness. Mm -hmm. okay? And their death, their death is a means of defending the religion of Islam because it exposes in one context, exposes the tyrants. The death of Imam Rabbah exposed Al-Ma'mun Al-Abbasi. 
ذا ديث اوف الامام الكاظم عليه السلام اكسبوز هارون الرشيد كنت كنت دي اكسبوز ان ان ديفرنت واي يعني فور اكزامبل فان تو اكسبوز سم ون يو نو اي وود ميك ا بلان ميك ا سكيم تو اكسبوز ام بات يو نو از ان نوت جوين الامام الحسين عليه السلام سبوك اجينست يزيد بن معاويه امام الحسين تراي تو ويك بيبل اب يوزنج ليكتشرز سيرمنز Uh, he th- he went to Mecca and he used Hajj as a means to propagate the message of Islam, but there was no way but to sacrifice himself for the sake of Allah to protect the religion of Islam. Mm-hmm. Now, not only that, in addition to that, he had to take the women and the children with him so that they would be taken as prisoners so that this message can remain alive of Imam al Hussein Salam Allah the message yeah. of Islam. So this is all submission to Allah. When Allah orders, this is the way. They submit to Allah and following that way. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Sheikh, the, the final question for tonight: uh, Is it possible uh, for someone? And I mentioned that a bit earlier as well. Um, for someone ordinary to have knowledge of the unseen, yeah, a lot of people claim that you know, if uh, when, when you're watching YouTube, when you're mm-hmm. watching TV, the the mind readers yeah, uh, and and those the, the the psychiatrists will tell you that you know what. You're feeling this. You're not feeling this, or you know, or someone that claims, and sometimes it becomes true. Is is that also given by God, or is we that something taught? We have to differentiate between the medical perspective versus those who do not have the medical background. Like I mean, we're talking about psychiatry. That's a medical perspective, so they might really analyze, like you know, how you're feeling, or psychologists, for example, they kind of analyze your feeling, and then they might give you some suggestions as to why you're feeling this way, etc., yeah. etc. Uh, the consequences of some of the actions you may be doing from the medical perspective. So this is the, the, the knowledge based on some scientific evidence or some um, data that, 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 that they collect. So that's yeah. one thing. This is different from those who, like you said, the palm readers or the mind readers, etc., etc. Those people, we reject what they, what, what, you know, they claim. Well, sometimes it's true. Well, you know, even if they get something right, But that may not necessarily mean that they have been given the ilm al ghayb through the divine purposes. So they learned it. They've learned it and could be through the jinn, wal ayyadu billah. Because jinn, magic. The, the, jinn, the jinn have the ability to go across time or distance. So, for example, some people, wal ayyadu billah, and this is getting into witchcraft and all this, which is all forbidden and haram in Islam, but it is there, it does exist. Uh, you know, there is sihr, the word sihr comes in the Quran, this magic, yeah. the black magic, where some people associate wal through the power of the jinn, which is not a divine power. This power is wal is an unhealthy power, evil power. And they can ask the jinn, go and find out what is so and so doing, let's say, in the other part of the world. Yeah. Then they'll immediately come back and say, well, you are going to be, or you just did this, and when you were over there, like, how did you know? I was like all the way because they had that connection with the jinn. So some people do have that power. The way to protect ourselves is reciting the four quls of the Quran, ayatul kursi on a regular basis, saying salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad, saying bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, a'udhu billahi min as-sami' al-alim min hamazat al-shayateen, wa'udhu bika rabbi an yahdurun. Some of these ver- uh, ayat and some of those uh, adhkar that Ahlul Bayt have taught us to protect ourselves from this. Mm-hmm. So people don't have. Now, Some people, because of their submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of their submission, Allah gives them some of this power. But this is different because these people do not use it in an evil way. They use it in a positive way. Uh So some mu'mineen, people who follow the path, they pray, they fast, they pray in a salatul layl, read the Quran, don't disobey Allah. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give them some power, some ability to see of what is going on and what is happening in the future or in the near future. Uh, but this is very limited, yeah. unlike Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and his family who have in the worldly creation sense an unlimited power given to them by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the ultimate supreme knowledge of the unseen is, is within Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he has some knowledge that only he knows of. Mm-hmm. No one of his creation is aware of. So that is the ultimate knowledge of Allah. So we have these different states or ranks. Allah, the ultimate, knows everything intrinsically, yes. independently. And then you have him spreading this knowledge onto people. 
with different degrees. Uh -huh. Ahlul Bayt have the pinnacle of that knowledge, and then, and then the people after them, it varies in their mm -hmm. ranks. Inshallah, thank you very much for the beautiful discussion today. And uh, we beautifully cleared up uh, some of the most important and crucial misconceptions that are going around uh, the societies and the communities today. Thank you very much uh, no, for sir. joining us tonight. Hopefully we can continue uh, the discussion but after a different time. Thank you very much once again, respective viewers. Thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Hopefully we can uh, understand what Islam is all about and how can we clear up some of the misconceptions uh, revolving uh, around uh, topics such as this. Hopefully you're benefited from this. Once again, thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.